Ruth Edmonds Hill is from Cambridge uh, area. She's lived there for a good part of her life. Uh, many years with one of the most beloved and admired storytellers of our time known as Brother Blue. Ruth is an American scholar, an oral historian, and she's also known as an iconic figure in the oral storytelling community in the U.S. and abroad. She has done work as oral storytelling editor, educator, and she is oral history coordinator at the Schlesinger Library at Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. She has directed a number of oral history projects during her time there, which began sometime in the mid-1970s with a team of interviewers, including, briefly, uh, projects for black women history, oral history, women in federal government, the feminist oral history project about the National Organization for Women, the Chinese American women oral history, Cambodia American women oral history, Latina oral history project, and oral history of Radcliffe College during Matina Horner years. She's a longtime member of Oral History Association and worked on a number of committees and been on the editorial board for Oral History Review. There's a lot to say about Ruth and her work over time. She has also served in various capacities related to oral history in the arts, including the National Endowment of the Humanities, Massachusetts Cultural Council, Cambridge Arts Council, and the Archives of American Art at the Smithsonian Institution. And other professional activities include producing a storytelling event for the Lincoln Center and organizing 10 years of Women of Courage, a photographic exhibition based on black women oral history project. She has also authored a forward for Keeping Family Stories Alive and contributed an entry for African American National Biography on her great grandfather, Samuel Harrison, who was chaplain of the 54th Regiment in the Civil War. And in her hometown, she was, has also been doing activism in petitioning for her great grandfather's house, which w had, was ready to be demolished by the town. And she petitioned for this as a, a building of great history, historical value, so that the, the uh, drive, the initiative for demolishing the building uh, was refused and funds were raised and awareness was raised so that the house has been saved and is a National Register of Historic Places. There's a documentary on her great-grandfather's life and they are now creating uh, a museum out of his house there in Pittsfield. Ruth has given many workshops on oral history and storytelling for a variety of venues including storytelling conferences in the U.S., British Columbia, Sweden, Eden, England, Scotland, MCI, Norfolk Prison, and many colleges and universities and foundations for humanities, women's studies, and more. And I just wanted to read before she comes up here to share a bit of her work in oral history, an interview from Spare Change with Brother Blue, the two of them interviewing each other about the work they do. And what Brother Blue said, well, actually Ruth had said, it is interesting that my work is so closely related to yours as a storyteller. And Brother Blue said, yes, it is closely related to my work. Now I want to tell you something from my heart, from my soul. I'm so impressed with this work you're doing. I want you to know and all the work to know that your work inspires me. I feel that your stories of women's lies have, as they have told them, women of many colors, from different economic, social, religious strata reveal the heroism, the noble possibility people can rise to. These women were and are warriors in the human struggle. If I were asked which one of us was doing the most transformative healing work in this world to bring about change, I would say that the stories you collect are more revelatory, more powerful, more appealing to the hearts, minds, and souls of the worldwide human family than the stories I tell. What a, what a beautiful tribute. And then, of course, Ruth went on to argue a little bit. <laughs> but 
<laughs> it is about Ruth today. And I did want to read that passage before she comes up here to share some of her stories with you. Please help me welcome Ruth Edmonds here. So the first project I worked on was the Black Women Oral History Project, and that went from 1976 to 1981. We have 72 interviews. And Letitia Woods Brown, who was on the Schlesinger Library's advisory committee, suggested that uh, it would be a good way to get the lives of African American women into the collections because they're not going to give their papers to, uh, what should we say, very white Radcliffe College. <laughs> so I found myself the coordinator of the project. And I'll just tell you, my mother, Florence Edmonds, got into the project in a very roundabout way, and I won't explain how. But she was a nurse, and she got her training in New York at the, uh, um, and she spent the time at, Link at Columbia University also studying nursing social work. So some of you who are older would know these, and she worked at the Henry Street Settlement in the 1920s, and she didn't do any work after that until she, after, until Second World War. And she went with the Visiting Nurse Association in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, where I grew up, and Pittsfield General Hospital later on. Now, another person in the project was Rosa Parks. And uh, she attended a 1955 uh, workshop at the Highland, uh, Highlander School, which specialized in uh, social justice training. So we always have this picture of this uh, oh, tired uh, woman who just couldn't get up, but she had had her training and she knew what she was going to do. So one of the things back there I brought a little uh, excerpt from the uh, project telling about that. Another one was Clementine Hunter, and she was a maid and a cook on a plantation in Louisiana. And she didn't have any art training, and she began uh, with some paints that had been left behind by a guest in the, on the plantation. But now, some of her paintings are worth $8,000 or more. So I brought a little bit there just to, with some pictures, just so you know what kind of things she did. Now, the traveling photographic exhibit Women of Courage came about from Judith Sedwick, who had read about the project and just wanted to make some kind of a contribution. And she photographed uh, most of the women, so you'll find some black and white uh, photographs. Some of the women had died, but I wanted everybody who had been in the project to be part of the uh, exhibit. And it was on the road for about 10 years, from 1984 to 1994, and then we packed it up and put it away. And right now, it's in China. But I didn't have to send the crates. We can do it digitally now, so. <laughs> Next project was Women in the Federal Government, and that was from 1981 to 1983. And we have 38 interviews there. So women who uh, had served in executive and judicial branches of the US Federal Government. Now, one person was Grace Hopper. She was a computer pioneer, and she began as a midshipman in the waves, and when she retired, she was a rear admiral. But she was inventor of a COBOL computer language. Uh, now, you've heard the term debugging or bug? Uh, all right, she didn't invent the term, but she was on the scene when a moss blew into a computer and stopped it, and they had found it. What made the computer stop? It was the bug. So now they, the term debug. <laughs> <laughs> so Virginia McLaughlin, in 1939, she began as a stenographer at the Federal Reformatory for Women in Alderson, West Virginia. And obviously she, she did a beautiful job because she retired as warden in 1969. Another person in that project, Wilma Victor, she's Choctaw, uh, Choctaw Indian, and one time was apprentice teacher in a Nav uh, Navajo reservation. But in 1971, she went to the U.S. Department of the Interior, and she began working to see that Indian needs were effectively met. Next project I worked on, Tully Crenshaw Feminist Oral History Project, 1990 to 1993, we have 44 interviews. Mary Jean uh, was with the now Legal Defense and Education Fund, and she had the idea that after 25 years of the organization, it was time to get the story of what had happened. So the interviewees, interviewers rather, were members and former members of NOW, because uh, when they knew there was going to be a project, they got excited. Well, now we can find out what the real story is. So, 
So there's a little bit, just a little bit about pers their personal lives. On most of the projects, we've done life stories, but here they were interested in talking about uh, national organizations for women. Now, obviously, we had to have Betty Friedan. Uh, she wrote The Feminine Mystique, which came out in 1963. And in 1966, she was a co-founder of NOW. And in 1971, she was inv involved in the founding of the National Women's Political Caucus. Another person was Pauli Murray. Uh, she was co-founder of NOW and one of the very few African-American women who was in the organization. And she was the first African-American female Episcopal priest. Another person in the project is Gloria Steinem. Uh, she was founder and editor of Ms. Magazine. In 1971, she helped to found the National Women's Political Caucus with Shirley Chisholm, African-American woman, with Bella Absog, and Dorothy Height, and, uh, and others. And in 1993, she was the founder of Take Our Daughters to Work Day. I think it's now Take Our Daughters and Sons, something. <laughs> so. Next project, Cambodian American Women Oral History Projects, 1987 to 1993. We have 10 interviews. And these were done a little differently. They weren't done in life stories but we did them as themes. For example, there would be one theme on family background, another interview on uh, holidays, celebrations, another one about the trauma story and how they got to, what was happening with the Pol Pot regime and how they got to this country afterwards. And a theme, one would be on their life in the United States. And one of the women who assisted in the pro project was Svang Tor, uh, because these women spoke in the Khmer language and Dr. Richard Malika, who was with the Indo-Chinese Psychiatry Clinic in Brighton, he was the one who got the idea of the project after knowing about the Black Women Oral History Project. And uh, he thought, well, how am I going to get their stories? And Svang worked with him, and she's a, a lovely woman. We have her uh, interview also in the project. And so now, I hadn't mentioned, but legal agreements for each of these projects. Women had to sign a legal agreement about whether they were willing to have this material in the library, whether scholars could use the material, and they would sign their names. But these legal agreements, we had each, they were given a number and their initials, and the legal agreements are separate. So if you look at the uh, um, transcript, you wouldn't know really who it was. And another thing, I just might as well mention it now, each woman's life, whatever project, worked up in a, uh, a separate bound volume. So if you came to the Schlesinger Library and were interested in a particular woman's life, you'd be given a, a volume like this, uh, hopefully a completed volume. <laughs> um, then there was the Latina project, Latina Oral History Project. That was in 1989, and we only have six interviews there. Uh, we were trying to find out what there might be of interest if we did get a project, and uh, Pat King, who was the director of the library, died after we had this much material, and we just never did uh, continue. But we didn't have any information in the, about uh, women's lives of Spanish-speaking uh, Spanish backgrounds, women in the Boston area and the Northeast. And so that was an opportunity, we had hoped, to get something like that. Now, the committee had shared Spanish-speaking backgrounds, but they came from different cultures. Uh, we had Mexican, Cuban, Chilean, Argentinian, and Puerto Rican. So I must admit that sometimes when we had our meetings, we didn't get a lot of quote-unquote work done because they wanted to find out about each other's lives because it was just <laughs> completely different background. Oh, you do this in Chile, you do this in Argentina. Oh, interesting, interesting. <laughs> Now, one of the women was Martha Montero Siebert. Her mother was ex Mexican, and her father Costa Rican, and she always felt this dual uh, citizenship. And she came to the United States when she was three years old, and in her interview, she said she learned English from Little Lulu Comics. Now, I don't know Little Lulu Comics, but I trust her if she says she learned English that way, okay. Another one, was, you know, I have an excerpt from, um, Martha's uh, uh, interview back there, and I think I think I covered that area. I'm not sure. Uh, Maria Klein. Now Maria, at the age of 13, she decided she was going to come to the United States. Uh, she was disillusioned with Castro, and she already was involved in the Counter Revolution. So finally, at the age of 15, she came to the United States just by herself. 
left her whole family behind. And she became the first Hispanic woman principal in the Boston school. So a lot happened between the age of 15 and, and reaching that. And so I do have an excerpt from her interview back there. Now, the Chinese American Women Oral History Projects. It began in 1990 and it's still in progress. And we have 25 interviews so far. And the project began with Caroline Chang, who was with the U.S. Civil Service Department uh, in, in the Boston area, meeting Pat King, the director of Schlesinger Library, on a trip to Turkey, of all places. And somehow they got to talking about oral history. And Caroline learned about the Black Women Oral History Project. She said, oh, we'd like to do the same kind of thing for the Chinese. So one of the women there was Rulan Pian. She was born in Cambridge when her father was a visiting instructor at Harvard. And then the family lived in China and Paris, and she came back to the United States at the age of 16. And she got her academic degrees from Radcliffe. And she eventually became a music professor at Harvard. Another one was Sister Ruth Marie O'Donnell. She had a music and pharmacy background and became a Mary Knoll sister. She worked in the Hong Kong area from 1958 to 1969 and then spent 20 years working in Boston's uh, Chinatown. Another person, Kim Ho Chin, she was a seamstress. Now her interviews in the Toysonese language and it's been very difficult to find someone to transcribe. You see, these are done uh, orally and someone has to sit down and say, what did they say? And uh, <laughs> that was the problem with the, Khmer, with the uh, Cambodian one. They did it in Khmer, we had to send it to Washington, D.C to get it translated from Khmer to English, and then hopefully straighten out the grammar, but not too much of that. We tried to leave it the best we could. But this has been one that's been hanging on a long time just because we couldn't find someone who can deal with choice and ease. So if I have any volunteers, I will accept. <laughs> now, uh, the last project is Oral History of Radcliffe College during the Matina Horner years. And from 1998 to 1999, we got 43 interviews. And Martina was the sixth president of Radcliffe College from 1972 to 1989. So in these interviews, much of the discussion is about uh, Harvard-Radcliffe relationship. What's gonna happen with Radcliffe? Is it gonna stay alive? And it finally disappeared in 1999 when it merged with Harvard. And so now we have the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. Um, so Martina, was the sixth president of Radcliffe College. Very interesting lady. I don't think I, I didn't, uh, no, I didn't bring any excerpt from, from, there, from this project for you to read. Warren Wacker, Warren uh, was a medicine professor and, and director of Harvard University Health Services and master of three Harvard houses. Uh, just obviously not all at once, but master of the house is like the headmaster, you take care of the students, da, 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 kind of thing. And I don't know how he got to be master of three different ones, but everybody must have liked it or he wouldn't have done it. <laughs> Alelia Bundles, she was on the Schlesinger Library Advisory Council. And she's the author of books about her great-great-grandmother, Madam C.J. Walker, who was a self-made African-American woman millionaire uh, through her hair products for African-American women. And her great-grandmother, Alelia Walker, was a Harlem arts patron in the 1920s. Another person in that project was Derek Bach, who was president of Harvard University from 1971 to 1991, and then interim president from 2006 to 2007. And my question was, whoever gets to be president of a place like that twice? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there was just a lot of discussion about the uh, of, uh, Harvard Radcliffe uh, relationship. That was the important thing, and so. Um, if I will see you afterwards if you have questions. I'd be glad to answer them. And there's plenty back there for you to pick up when you, uh, when you leave. Skipping stones. There's an art to it, all about control. Pick a thin, smooth, flat stone Cradle it on your middle finger, thumb on top, gentle, firm. Curl your sensitive forefinger around the edge, that's for control. 
lower the stone parallel to the lake's surface, close but not touching, cock your wrist back, flip and release, spin stone off that forefinger till it twirls and kisses the water, dances, skip, 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 gone. We're good at this art. Who finds the best stone? Who skips the most? We know how to win. My son's fingers search the sand. Round pebbles, no use. Muscle shells, they skip but not as well as stones. And then, just under the sand, a stone that feels perfect. Thin edges, a little belly to skim the water. Perhaps a little too long? Perhaps too hard to control? He holds it out on his palm and my breath stops. Here is no random stone for our game. In my son's hand lies an Abenaki spearhead, dark green flint flecked with yellow, scarcely dulled by centuries submerged. Too long, too hard to control, sharp enough to reach the heart not to be skipped. So, ant analogies abound. We live in groups wired by instinct and are bar part of a bigger picture that none of us see. Analogous to animals with primal love, our Paleolithic ancestry won't serve to separate you and me from cats and dogs. I'm well aware that you and I are merely mammals, but sitting here together, I feel more soul than body, more thought than instinct, and more passion than evolution. You sing me a song, I la la along, and together we make music and we make art and love. My house is not an anthill. My violin is not a tool to gather food or kill things. I can't sense danger with my nose. My other senses show the beauty of a rose and sitting here together, our body heat combining, our pheromones alighting, I know we are but cogs in a bigger wheel. The world turns fast and we fly with it sometimes involuntarily and sometimes unwittingly. We seem so big and are so small. An idea that's always easy to recall, that far away we look like ants and close, I see your ingrown hairs. I want to lean against you and let myself fall asleep against my will. My body tells me my eyes are closing. I need to rest and I need your arms to hold me, to tell me it's my choice. Sitting here together, we fall asleep together and dream of bigger things than me. Thank you. If 
I thought I could have changed God only knows where we might be Knuckles have been scraped to bleeding in creating this need to segregate. Overgrown now with moss and lichen, a living fence, piled up with the hopes of those long gone from us. Keeping at bay, standing watch, separating the land between neighbors and kin. Not so much keeping out as holding in. Dotted sometimes with the trunks of trees, sunken with the bones of favored hounds, serene in their craftsman's mastery of order over nature, now years gone by. They stand as witnesses to history's passage, centuries of the farm, the field, the forests looming over and around them. Thank you. Rosemary 